Welcome to the Path to CPO, where we peel back the layers of success and delve into the journeys of the most dynamic chief people officers. I'm your host, Nelson Sibelingam, CEO and co-founder of How Now. Together, we'll explore the trials, the triumphs and insights of these trailblazers across people, culture and HR at some of the fastest growing companies in the world. This is not just their story, it's a roadmap for all aspiring people leaders. Tune in, rise up, and let's embark on this enlightening journey together. Angela, welcome to the show. Thank you. So glad to be here, Nelson. So in preparation for for this episode, Angela, I was uh, reading about you, seeing the things you've done, and something caught my eye, which was um, essentially a recommendation you were given on LinkedIn. Um, And I just want to pick out a couple of words from it, which said... Angela is the dream leader, period. That, that, that was the quote from, from a much, much larger recommendation. And there are many more like that. But what I wanted to ask was taking you back to the early part of your career. Was there a dream leader for you? Actually, I wouldn't necessarily say it was even a leader to begin with. I, uh, Growing up, my mom was the benefits administrator for Avon Corporation. And so when I was younger, she'd take me to work in Manhattan. Oh, wow. And they worked, she worked in this gorgeous building overlooking Central Park. So I'd hear her conversations. I'd see her bring work home. I'd see her interactions with her employees. And it really prompted me to think about that role in HR and wanting to give back and see people grow and develop. And so I would say that was probably my biggest influence. And I got my start with Marriott. I was working. I was a young single mom. I was 17 when I had my daughter. And uh, I was going to school during the day and I was working night shift at the Marriott. And I really, I was doing uh, call uh, guest services. So I really wanted an opportunity. I really wanted an opportunity in HR, but I didn't have any experience. And Marriott had this awesome cross training program. And I had a, a opportunity to cover for somebody that was going on maternity leave. That gave me my first stint in HR. And uh, I would say, you know, it was a, it was really interesting to interact with folks. We had a large international population. We had a, a really robust cross training program. Uh, and so that was that was kind of foot in the door. Right. Uh, and and from there, I. Uh, I wanted to keep progressing. I would say I spent the majority of my work in the logistics space where I got to come in and bring together seven mom and pop trucking companies that all came together to form one. Uh, lots of different personalities, lots of different ways of doing things and uh, and and really kind of focusing on the back to the basics. Right. Uh, that opportunity really led to a lot of uh, M&A experience, a lot of um, diffusing I would say kind of different personalities and getting everybody to a level playing field. Uh, lots of investment in people. Uh, we really focused on, I wanted that we had really high turnover in logistics. And I don't know if you're familiar with the book, The Stay Interview by Dick Finnegan, right. but he focuses a lot on uh, getting leaders to answer questions or getting leaders to ask questions that are more focused on the individual, not so much focused on the job. And it helps to build rapport. You know, they say people get attached to people, not to companies. Yeah. And so I think Dick's book really speaks to that. And so we leveraged that tool across. We grew the company from 1,200 to 15, to, I'm sorry, from 1,200 to 14,000 employees. Right. And I we really leveraged that book and that cadence to kind of expand it across our workforce and get our leaders really to buy in. And it wound up drastically reducing our turnover because we were invested in our people. And so I would say kind of, you know, as I I was growing my career, I really learned, you know, early on from mom, that value in people and then spanning that over this 10 year career with building our company through multiple locations, multiple personalities. Uh, And then uh, we eventually sold that organization to actually our largest competitor, which was an interesting experience. And uh, uh, from there, moved on to the HR kind of tech, or excuse me, the, uh, the healthcare tech. Startup industry had a couple of opportunities there to really understand very big difference in workforce going right. from, uh, you know, blue collar workers to going to more of that kind of that technical professional uh, and really uh, an opportunity to see the different up, uh, different learning styles, you know, where in the tech world, right, we really want to focus on certifications. 
We want to stay ahead of what's going on in the technology sector and different um, uh, uh, different platforms, uh, different coding software, and and uh, got an opportunity to really kind of stress into our work within those uh, those areas. And then uh, I would say kind of mo- leading to my most recent role, and, and as I've gone along the way in my career, one of the things I would say is most helpful uh, on my LinkedIn profile, I mentioned kind of a list of thank yous to folks who have just really inspired my journey along the way. And I built just robust relationships that have really led to those different opportunities. My current role with as Chief People Officer with Health Access actually came about as part of that networking. Our uh, our private equity firm, Revelstoke Capital, uh, Capital Group, owned one of the prior companies I was with when I was with Datalink Software and uh, got an opportunity there to re- to um, achieve great places to work two years in a row. Uh, we achieved uh, a few other certifications there, but really building a phenomenal culture focused on people, developing and growing our people, giving them new opportunities, um, collaborating even during COVID, you know, kind of shifting from, from on-premise to remote work. And so really had an opportunity for Revelstoke to see what I could bring to the table. And last summer, they had acquired another organization. I had left Datalink. Um, they acquired another organization called a Health Access Group. And um, oh, coincidentally, while I was while I was at Datalink, we were hiring for some C-suite executives, and I had interviewed a gentleman by the name of Matt Hughes. Um, for a CFO role with us. He had been with a, another company for 12 years, phenomenal background. And he and I just hit it off. Um, and so we stayed in contact for quite a bit of time, but we he he chose he chose to remain with his current company. Um, so fast forward about, I would say two years later, uh, uh, Revelstoke acquires Health Access and I get a, a call from Healthax, from uh, Revelstoke, and then from Matt within about 24 hours of each other regarding this opportunity as chief people officer. So the networking, the experience that I had in that prior company really led to really? these yeah. connections, this, new, this opportunity. Yeah. And with the, I guess, with the leadership piece, Angela, I mean, you're being described as a dream leader and a lot of uh, the feedback you've you've got and the recommendations talk about your uh, leadership skills. So I just want to kind of dive into that a bit more to go. What do you think makes a good leader and how did you acquire the skills to be a better leader? I, uh, I, I always consider myself an operational HR leader. So I th- I feel like first and foremost, knowing the business and the industry that you're in, in order to put programs into place that are going to advance the skills of your people, you really have to understand what's going to hinder and what's going to help. So I would say that per- that piece first. Next, I would say knowing your team, building that rapport with your team. The- it is a human centric world today. It's not just about work. It's I'm a big believer in mindset and the power of mindset and growth. And so I really work with my team to invest in them, understanding what makes them tick, understanding, you know, what their career aspirations are. And so I work with my team um, and I bring that back to kind of our business objectives. So we have some pretty meaty objectives this year, and it's helping to align their personal growth story. And this isn't just for my team, but this is also for the leaders in our company. Right. It's aligning what their growth story is to the opportunities and objectives in our business. And then you, you get the best of both worlds. You, you're advancing the business through achieving those objectives, but you're also advancing careers. When you were initially becoming, uh, going into leadership roles, Angela, were what was your approach to learning? You know, was it reading books, listening to podcasts? Were there particular people you'd reach out to and, and ask for help? In those early days of becoming a leader, what did you lean on to learn? Uh, I would say in the early days, it was really mentors. I uh, That 12 years with uh, with the logistics company I was with, I, I always say I grew from a child to an adult in that company. And uh, it was really thanks to, we had a, a really solid uh, CEO 
uh, that had come in a few years into my into my opportunity. He actually started as our chief revenue officer, and he really just took me under his wing. And I can I remember we were building out an entire sales strategy, sales team strategy for the company. And I can remember sitting in a hotel lobby and literally taking up all four walls of the lobby with just papers of what this team was going to look like. It was it was about a hundred and fifty kind of people that we were they were playing with. And, uh, and so re- that, that lesson, he, uh, that was, his name was Michael Shelton. He really taught me, uh, tr- you know, how to grow a organization within a company and how to build out org structure. Eventually he became the president of our board and we are, we had promoted our CFO, Pedro Navarrete to, uh, to a, to the CEO. And he as well really just, invested in not just me but our executive team so he was a mentor where he taught accountability you he taught us you have to meet your deadlines if you commit to a deadline you have to meet it uh and and if you're not going to meet it just communicate but learning that that you know set a date commit to your dates um learning that we're always looking to advance the company so how do you balance the tactical area of hr while at the same time driving forward new projects and objectives to advance the business. So I would say really early in my career, it was really mentors. This second stage, I would say, of my career has really been uh, education. Right. I, uh, I'm a big reader, and I, I, I landed on audiobooks maybe and podcasts maybe about three years ago, four years ago. And uh, I would say I probably average about 50 books a year. Wow. Now, I uh, I also returned to school in, in my husband was was pursuing his degree when he and I met and I decided to return to school because I was a single mom. I didn't really and balancing work. I didn't get much time. So I I uh, completed my associate's degree in 2019, and then I decided I was just going to keep going. I did my bachelor's in uh, 2021 and I finished my master's last year. And I would say, you know, really uh, learning to kind of take that time for myself and advance my and and just advance my education. I've learned to uh, put a lot of that practice into place today. Do you think um, or rather, do you think there's any kind of impact being a single mom at a young age has had on your approach to how you've built your career? I can tell you I'm very empathetic uh, to uh, to parents out there that are really trying to balance their careers and their their family lives. I think uh, I think there's more awareness being brought to that now with with the shift in in remote work and and the post COVID. Uh, but I would say that uh, I definitely fueled me. I uh, I wanted to you know we we had some difficult times when they were younger financially, and it really fueled me. I, I think that's kind of at the core of my career and my growth right. is I wanted to provide a you know when they were younger we we lived in up in the projects we we um, we I can remember the times we didn't know when the next check was coming in and it was really difficult and and so it really fueled me to want more for my kids want better for them. And as my as I that fuel really just delved into my career, I would say the biggest challenge, uh, especially when I was with the logistics company, I traveled all the time. Right. So I feel like there's pockets that I missed. My kids are now 30 and 25. I feel like there's pockets that I've missed, you know, kind of when they were younger. But uh, I'm super proud of the success. And they always remind me, you know, and I have those little mom guilt moments. They always remind me. That uh, you know, mom, we we love you. We appreciate you. We did. We we love you. Inspired us, and so that that just that makes it all the while worth it. You mentioned about getting the great place to work um, twice, two years running, uh, and I wanted to kind of go through that process, right? Of um, what does it take to to create a great place to work? Uh, openness, trust, and transparency. I think, uh, and I would probably add communication to that too, but I, I think great places to work, it's so focused on culture and you can't, employees are not going to just check a box because you want an award. They need to feel it. They need to see it. They need to, you know, the our, your leaders need to lead by example. And so I think it's really takes building a culture where your leaders are interacting with your employees, where there is collaboration across departments, where 
when times are tough, you're open and transparent in those conversations and, and, and willing to share, hey, we're on some difficult times right now, but here's the plan to get us out of it. Here's how we can all rally together to, to overcome. And so I, I really think it just comes down to openness, transparency, communication. And, and just taking, say, openness, Angela, how would you, let's just say you go into an organization where the feedback has been, they don't feel the organization is open. They think the leadership team is a bit opaque. They don't always know what's going on. And you've just joined the CPO. You need to turn this around uh, and, and help us turn this into a great place to work. So what, what would your approach be there of tackling something like openness? I think health access is a perfect example of that. So when I I joined in uh, August and our uh, current CEO, Matt, he joined in May of last year. And when we walked in, we really found that it was a, uh, a lack of empowerment, a lack of openness and transparency. And so we did a couple things. We, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the book, The Advantage by Patrick Lencioni, but Matt happened to be walking through the airport um, picked it up and he focuses really on identifying your kind of what the, why does your company exist? You know, for us, uh, it's, we exist because we believe that the U S healthcare system can be better. And so it's then going through, all right, now that you know why you exist, uh, you identify how you're going to get there. You identify what are some of the core behaviors that you want to display, uh, being openness and transparency being one of those for us. Uh, and then you really define what your communication plan is going to be back to your employees to really bring it all together. And so Matt does this amazing weekly message where he speaks from the heart and he brings through, in a sense, what's occurring in our business and how it ties back to where we're trying to go, how it ties back to how we're trying to behave. Uh, we used examples recently uh, where we we had a a um, we had a service issue, and we were able to show how quickly our teams came together to turn things around because of that openness and transparency. We did a uh, state of the company address where we literally spoke for forty five minutes, and we really talked about the good, the bad, and the ugly, and how it's shifting. And so I would say, you know, even we could see signs from from past engagement surveys that had occurred prior to May to in November, we partnered with Gallup on their Q12. And we were expecting pretty challenging results. And we scored a score of 3.74, which on a five point scale, which within, you know, Gallup's book of business, we hit the 25th percentile. Now we're, our next one, we're determined to hit the 50th. Um, but to see that the change that we made literally, you know, in our few, first few months of being there had shifted engagement so quickly, uh, we could see that the steps that we were starting to take were working. It's amazing. Um what are the secrets, Angela, you've learned about getting C-suite buy-in for, for HR initiatives? How do you get the buy-in? Um, I, I think I'm going to, I'm going to be a little vulnerable for a second, Nelson. I, uh, only cause, uh, I, it's funny as you, this, one of the other questions we had talked about made me think of this. Um, but I would say, you know, to get C-suite buy-in first and foremost, I had to overcome my imposter syndrome. I, uh, I know kind of it's a buzzword. We hear it a lot lately. And I uh, I recognize that in prior roles, although I built the respect of our executive team, I would look at myself and I'm like, who is that person? Does she really have all that knowledge and experience? Are people really going to buy into what she's saying? And I would doubt myself. And so we would have meetings at times and my peers would speak about, you know, maybe challenge me and I would back down and I recognize that, no, I, I've been doing HR for almost 25 years. I know. It. And so I would say partnering with my existing leadership team, my existing executive team, I no longer have that. I recognize that it was a lack of confidence and I really, I, I leveraged, I, I leveraged uh, mindfulness. I leveraged some meditation apps and, uh, and I found that once I really kind of recognized that that was all in my head and, and to trust my experience and my knowledge, um, that, that disappeared, kind of, it dissipated. And as I work alongside my executives on our health access team, 
uh, what I find is they they trust, they believe in, their, they want to partner together on the initiatives. And so it's really just building that rapport with them. It's helping them to understand the why. I do a lot of, hey, if we do this, this is how it's going to impact our employees and this is how it's going to impact our company. Um, we're, uh, we also, we, we challenge each other to be different. We challenge each other to challenge the status quo. And so I think that has also helped where, you know, you come into organizations and you you think that, hey, I've been doing this for 20 years. I got a toolkit I work from, and I'm just going to trust the process that I've done over and over again. And I was I was one of those people who had that mindset. Uh, it was very successful to me. But what I found post-COVID is the world of work has shifted, and it's time to start looking at new things. And I think the How Now platform and the direction we're heading from a people a people basis or kind of skills basis is really is really coming together at this point. So if I can, I'll, I'll share with you maybe a current example of yeah. a project that we're working on that I've had to create buy-in from our executive team. And I think team kind of teams us both up with what we're both trying to do. Uh, I, uh, I, as I, as I really challenge myself to, to kind of be different and, and look at new things now, I have started to research everything. So if I want to launch a new program, I'm doing research to see what other companies are doing. So recently we are preparing for our annual merit increase process. And I wanted, we want, we did away with the annual performance review, but I wanted to see, you know, besides leveraging past performance, what can we look at differently? And I landed on some articles that I found about uh, skills-based merit increases, which are really focused on uh, skill-based development and continuous learning. And so there are merit increases that are are based on expanding skills, uh, expanding knowledge in, in their roles in their areas. And then just, you know, you can, you can base them on uh, looking at whether or not they took advantage of your tuition reimbursement program, looking at whether they are taking advantage of educational opportunities, seminars, certifications, internally and externally, really focused on the growth. A lot of our employees have been with our company for 20, 30, 40 years. We have really low voluntary turnover. We um, And so we have folks who know our products and our services inside and out. But the company historically had not had much opportunity for them to expand on those skills outside of that workplace. Right. So we have a vision to really in, build a workplace where we are investing in our people and their skills, regardless of whether those skills apply to our company or another company. So a good example would be uh, a, a entry level call center employee who comes in for an hourly position. How can we advance? their skills. We can teach them how to negotiate a contract. We right. can teach them how to budget and read a PL. We can teach them uh, how to lead a team. And so we really started looking at these skills. This is a three-year plan. This is over the next three years. Um, and our technical employees teaching them new technologies that maybe we don't have today, certain yeah. AI technologies that we want to look at, but we can start advancing those skills. They help us, but they also help those individuals. And so that whole that that whole kind of vision that I walked you through, I had to create buy-in from our executive team on that. It's a different way of thinking. It's a different way of approaching those merit increases. So it's really just educating to see the bigger picture, educating to understand that we now live in a human-centric work environment, and looking at the person individually and growing them is, is critical. And so as, as we've had these discussions and I kind of worked on this plan, the How Now platform, I'm like, this is perfect. It, it aligns perfectly to our vision because it's really focused on capturing all those data points on those skills and helping to bring it together in one platform. So whether it's, in a sense, on-the-job training yeah. or or negotiating that contract, we bring it into one robust library where we can help ease up the access for our employees and help them continue to expand. I love that. And, and you know, we've been advocating for a skills first approach to L&D uh, for a while. And, and often what surprises um, people leaders is actually it's relatively easier to get buy-in for a skills first approach to L&D rather than your kind of content based you know we're going to do training program x uh, and we're going to push this out because skills is a common language that the whole business understands right like the employee understands skills they understand skills they don't have and skills they do have and 
the business understands skills gaps and skills that we need to build to progress the business forward. And so actually it's a far easier way to get buy-in because you're now speaking a language that everyone across the business can understand versus you know traditional approach to l d being very much focused around programs and content who completed what and the reality is neither the employee or the business doesn't really care how much content they completed what they care about is how how much skills proficiency or how many skills did this thing help me build and how has it been effective at helping me grow my career so yeah definitely definitely love that and love that you're going through through um on that journey before we go into the quick fire angela i do want to ask you you know based on what you know today um what do you know what do you wish you knew back then at the start of your career based on what you know today oh that's a good question i uh i would say at the start of my career i wish i would the the growth that i've experienced from reading continuing my education um i i you know i did i did two life coaching certification courses last year. I, I'm in the process of pursuing my second executive coaching certification. I wish I would have realized early on the power of continuous learning. I think that uh, I, I think it would have I accelerated my growth maybe a little bit more and being able to put some other, you know, uh, other programs, new ideas into practice. I find that through, through reading, and like I said, in the podcast that I'm doing in my education, I feel like I'm really learning ideas that you can't necessarily find when you're just doing a quick Google search. And, you know, the more you bring it all together, my routine is I wake up at, at four, I go to the gym at five, and that's my audiobook time while I'm exercising. It's like my perfect brain growth stimulation. And then I come to work and I'm ready with all these ideas. My team has to like settle me down <laughs> sometimes. Um, but I think I think if I I would I would stress continuous learning and forward thinking is probably the area where I wish I would have learned earlier. All right, over to our quick fire round, Angela. And the first question ties in quite nicely with, what's your favorite book or podcast? Uh, my favorite book is The Code of the Extraordinary Mind by Vishen Lakiani. He uh, really challenges you to uh, to break your limiting beliefs to find yourself and it ties together a uh, growth mindset, uh, mental well-being and and really just kind of breaking those uh, breaking those limiting beliefs, the negative thoughts and really just focusing on the future and being the person that you want to be. Amazing. What's your best productivity hack? Uh, I uh, so my favorites that I usually teach to a lot of people on my team were inundated with emails. And uh, I feel like, as, especially as you know, as the as technology improves, we we continue to be um, minus the teams, which definitely helps in uh, in Slack. Um, but what I do is I actually have four folders that I, I title by action, review, um, follow up, and file. Right. And what I do is I will do a quick review of my emails. I put them in the appropriate categories in that action folder. I block one hour each morning. Those are anything that's going to take me longer than five minutes to review. And that, and I spend an hour each morning and I block my Fridays as well to just focus on those items or those tasks or projects that are going to take me a little bit longer. Love I've used that. that technique for like, I don't know how many years. I'm, I'm going to definitely try that, Andrew. I think the inbox <laughs> is, is the monster that I'm constantly fighting. So yeah, I'll definitely be trying. <laughs> And um, what's the best advice you've ever been given? Uh, the best advice I have ever been given. I would say to be myself, to just trust the process, believe that that uh, I have, believe in myself, to just have that that confidence to know that I can rely on my experience and my relationships on my on 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 just being me. And being able to just push forward. And the last one for you, Angela, is what are you most proud of? The uh, that is a picture that my daughter gave me for Christmas. It is me walking um, for my MBA graduation with my grandchildren. That is incredible. Um, thank you very much, Angela, and thank you for so candidly sharing your story. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for coming on the show. 
Thank you so much, Nelson. I've had a great time. Thank you for listening to another brilliant episode of L&D Disrupt, the podcast that's powered by HowNow. Our learning experience platform helps companies bring relevant learning and skills into the flow of work to make meaningful learning a part of everyday work. But don't just take our word for it. Here's what some of our customers have to say. And if you like what you hear and want to learn more about HowNow, just use the link in the description to book a demo. As a loyal L&D Disrupt listener, we'll send you a swag pack containing a copy of the book Learning at Speed and some How Now merch once we've shown you around. And we needed somewhere to have a central home for all of the learning content that was be cr being created at Pace. And we also really wanted to, to, to support and modernize learning. So moving to that 70-2010 model where learning is really integrated into the flow of work at the point of need. And we knew that How Now would be the perfect platform to support with that modernized approach. And I was confident that How Now was right for FitFlop because it passed the eyeball test at the Learning Technologies Conference, number one. Does it look like it's going to be user-friendly and people might actually want to use it? In my previous companies, I'm used to using very clunky LMSs that don't do much to help with engagement. We've just launched How Now, actually, um, where I am at the moment with Lucid Group, and um, what we've focused on is the building of habits around learning. So trying to get people into healthy and regular habit of learning so that it becomes an everyday activity as opposed to something they have to take lots of time out. We're very time poor. The tools they've got, the information they need is where they need it at the point. So integrating into Microsoft Teams as we use it or any other collaboration tool, making sure that any learning is accessible at their point of need. So um, where they can ask a search first question and then um, we can provide them the information they need straight away.